and I'll try to say some things maybe a little bit different. But this is the 1843 Pioneer Chart. It's called the 1843 Pioneer Chart because they were predicting the end of the world in 1843. But it was produced in May. But, yeah, it's just not close to my voice. Sorry. This is, did you get that recorded or do I have to say that again? This is the 1843 Pioneer Chart. It's called the 1843 Pioneer Chart because it's predicting the end of the world in 1843, but it was published in May of 1842 in fulfillment of the prophecy of Habakkuk chapter 2. When Sister White comments on this, she says, this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered except by inspiration. Um, she says the Lord, in that same paragraph, she says the Lord held his hand over a mistake, singular, in some of the figures, plural, 1843, 1843. Same mistake, but it impacted two different prophecies, the 2300 year prophecy, the 2520 prophecy, which all, very few of us, very few of us in Adventism know about the 18, the 2520 pioneer chart. We've been, I've been at preaching, presenting prophecy for 15 years now. And initially where I would go more often than not was South America. And one of the brethren that I would travel across South America with is sitting in the back row, Brother Ramon. And, and, and we've been, well, he's been to way more obscure places in South America than I have. But we were traveling in South America a great deal. And at that time, what we were teaching, what was important to teach, was the pioneer understanding of the daily in the book of Daniel. Okay, so over 10 years ago, we had, a, the, I knew a couple sisters uh, from Mexico that were translators, and we gave them this chart here. And they translated everything into Spanish. Then we took and we blocked out all the English words, and the one sister was a cal calligraphy, however you say that, she was really good at writing. And after we took a picture of this chart with all the words off, then she went back in and she put all the words back in in Spanish. And the reason I'm telling you this is that in order to defend the pioneer position of the daily at that time, I would be using this chart to make the argument that the pioneers believed the daily in the book of Daniel was paganism. But I was traveling in South America more than anywhere else. So I wanted to have a chart in Spanish. So over 10 years ago, we spent the time, the money, and the energy to produce this chart, the 1843 chart, in Spanish, and it's still around today. But the point is, I'm someone that has been using this chart you know, aggressively for 15 years, and it wasn't until 2004 that, that I saw this. <laughs> And I, I didn't see it on my own, someone had to tell me about it. And so that's the, we've, there's a lot of other stories like that about people that should be familiar with the 2520 that aren't. The Lord held his hand over this chart. That's one of the characteristics of this chart is that there's certain things that were, were purposely hid by him. In the history of the Millerites, this, these figures that were covered by his hands were designed to test God's people. That's what she said. This, this disappointment was designed to, to test that movement. But for those of you that come in earlier, we've read some Spirit of Prophecy quotes where Sister White's talking about the original faith of Adventism, the original doctrinal understanding of the Millerites, and she calls those the platform and the foundation of Adventism. And then she gives prophetic warnings that there, as history progresses in Adventism, that the foundations were going to come under attack. And the Bible teaches this too. That's why there has to be a restoration of the past to walk in, Isaiah 58, 12. And the past to walk in is Jeremiah 6, 16, the old past. So this is a, this is a theme of prophecy, that at the end of the world, God's people would have to return to the foundational truths. So what we did in the beginning, and, and maybe it didn't settle in for some of you, is what I am saying is that from my reading of the Spirit of Prophecy and the history of the Millerites, the truths that are represented on this chart are what you would call the foundations. And this chart, representing the platform and the foundations of Adventism, it had a mistake on it. And that mistake is reflected in these two figures. 
And but this chart, Sister White says, should be changed except by inspiration. After October 22nd, 1844, for three years, 1844 to 1846, the pioneers came together and they came to understand that the sanctuary was not the earth, it was the heavenly sanctuary. They came to understand the law of God, they came to understand the Sabbath, they came to understand the third angel's message. Those are the pillars. So in 1850, Sister Wright begins to get direction by the Lord that you need to produce a new chart. The new chart, this, is, this chart is the correction of this chart. They're the same charts. Habakkuk 2, right? The vision, make it plain upon tables in the plural. This chart possesses all the truths that are here, but down here in this corner, it possesses truths that are on this chart, and these truths down here are what we call the pillars of Adventism. Three angels' message, law of God. That's the distinction between the pillars and the foundation, and that's the historical development that you can recognize off these charts if you're willing to see. And the, and the point is some are setting off the foundation. Yeah. It, whether we, some of it, most of us that are off, there's probably, this is not totally accurate. I don't know how many groups there are in Adventism, but there's basically three groups. There's a group in Adventism that is, is attempting to come to understand the foundations and get, get upon them. Then there is a group in Adventism that is opposing those foundational truths. And then you've got the greatest majority of Adventism, from my human understanding, probably 98%, that we don't know one way or another. We don't even know that there's a controversy about those foundational truths going on. Okay, we're just, we're just in the middle ground. But there is a controversy going on, Bible prophecy. All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. You could see that prophetic principle in, in the handout we have. All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. And most of us in Adventism are familiar that Sister White talks about a shaking. Okay, there's been shakings throughout sacred history, but all of those shakings are prefiguring the final shaking in Adventism. And what I'm saying is the final shaking in Adventism, according to the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, has to do with these truths. Because when we return to the old past, there's a group in Adventism that says, we will not walk therein. And the God's watchmen are going to say, listen to the sound of the trumpet. And they will say, we will not hearken. We will not hearken. And the trumpets, the pioneer understanding of the trumpets are represented right here. This is the fifth trumpet, this is the sixth trumpet. And the pioneer understanding of the trumpet, you can't, can't separate the first four trumpets from the fifth and sixth or the seventh trumpet. They're, they're one prophecy can't just pick or choose. So when you see the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet, and here's the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet on these charts, where Jeremiah says that the watchmen are going to be saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet, and there's a group in Adventism that says, we will refuse to hearken. It's talking about the final shaking, the final controversy in Adventism, and the majority of Adventists do not realize that that controversy is already underway. All right, we can we can show you that as a people today, those of us that have an opinion, and most of us don't have an opinion, those of us that have an opinion, we have rejected these two prophecies, we've rejected this prophecy, we've rejected these two prophecies, we've rejected this prophecy, pretty much directly, just outright. To, rejected them. But what, what many of us don't understand, if you reject this prophecy, then you destroy this prophecy. And we all understand that the 2300 days is the foundation of Adventism. So when you come to grips with what the pioneer understanding of these truths are, and then you see the positions that we've taken in Adventism today, we're off the platform, we're off the foundation, and we're saying, <laughs> You know, we can make it more secure a different way. That's where we're at, but most of God's people do not understand that. And I said earlier, for those of you that didn't come in, and here I'm going to try to start making the point. When it comes to the controversy over the foundational truths, it is simultaneously the controversy over the spirit of prophecy. I mean, it's the simple English reading. 
that's what's, that's what's a real problem for the theologians and advocates of Ms. Sister White. Is she spoke in plain English. She didn't speak in Greek and Hebrew, which provides the theologians an opportunity to go in and say, well, the Greek means this and the Hebrew means this. Simple, simple English is what Sister White used. And you have it in your notes. We read it in the last presentation. She said she saw that God was in the publishment of this chart and that there's a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. My understanding of a prophet is she's got to be correct or she's a false prophet. So she, this, this is either, there's either a prophecy of this chart of the Bible, or there isn't, and if there isn't, then not only is this chart not mentioned in the Bible, Sister White's made a very glaring error. So you can't separate, and there's more reason, there's more information to prove that, you can't separate the shaking over the foundations of Adventism from the inspiration and authority of the spirit of prophecy. So, on the top of page 7, it says, God is not giving us a new message. We are to proclaim the message that in 1843 and 1844 brought us out of the other churches. Brothers and sisters, this, was, this chart was produced in May of 1842. You know how many they printed? 300. Do you know how many Miller Wright preachers there were? 300. Do you know how many of those use this chart exclusively? All of them. This is the only thing they were preaching. Period. So when she says we have no new message, we are to continue to present the message that brought the people out of the churches in 1843 and 1844. What is our message? It's the message on that chart. Or, Sister White's made a glaring error. Notice the next quote. God bids us give our time and strength to the work of preaching to the people the messages that stirred the women, men and women in 1843 and 1844. What messages stirred the people in 1843 and 1844? Notice the next quote from Joseph Bates. Now our history shows that there were hundreds teaching from the same chronology chronological charts that William Miller was all of one stamp. Then it was the oneness of the message all on one theme, the coming of the Lord Jesus at a certain time, 1844. The message that stirred the people that we're to give our time and strength to is the message on the 1843 chart. Manuscript releases, volume 21, page 437 says, all the messages, let me read it differently. Some of the messages given from 1840 to 1844 are to be made forcible now. All. All. All the messages. For there are many people who have lost their bearing. The message are to go to all the churches. Christ said, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. Blessed are the eyes which saw the things that were seen in 1843 and 1844. The message was given, and there should be no delay in repeating the message. For the signs of time are fulfilling, the closing work must be done. A great work will be done in a short time. A message will, be, will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. As a Seventh-day Adventist, when Sister White talks about the loud cry message, what's she talking about? Latter-day Latter message? Third Angel's message? Sunday Law message? Revelation 18 message? That's the loud cry of the Third Angel, right? So do you see what she's saying is, is you can't give the loud cry message if it's not based on the messages that were given in 1840 to 1844. They're, they can't separate them. A message will soon be given by God's appointment that will swell into a loud cry. Then Daniel will stand in his lot to give his testimony. Those who stand as teachers and leaders in our institutions are to be sound in the faith and the principles of the third angel's message. God wants his people to know that we have the messages he gave it to us in 1843 and 
starts in 1798 at the time of the end. It ends in 1844. 1798, there's an increase of knowledge. The Lord raises up William Miller to begin to present the first angel's message and those men that were working with him. His message was based upon the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. That's what it was all about. It's a time prophecy. All you have to do is look at the 1843 chart and see all the time prophecies represented on that chart. To understand that's what they were predicting was a message based upon time prophecies. In 1840, the first angel's message was empowered. It was empowered. That's a four, not a nine. It was empowered by the fact that in 1838, Josiah Lynch had written an article using the year day principle predicting that in 1840, the Ottoman Empire would collapse in fulfillment of the time prophecy of Revelation 9.15, 391 years and 15 days. Everyone thought that, that he was a lunatic and a fanatic, but then shortly before this August of 1840, he fine-tuned his calculation and predicted that not only would the Ottoman Empire collapse in August of 1840, but it would collapse on August 11th, 1840. Sister White comments on this, in the great controversy, it says the event exactly fulfilled the prediction when it became known, multitudes, when it became known, multitudes became convicted of the correctness of the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. What happened with the fulfillment of the time prophecy of the Ottoman Empire when it came to its end as predicted on August 11, 1840, is that the year-day principle of Bible prophecy was confirmed before the world. And you know that in Revelation chapter 10, verse 10, that John is told to go and take the little book out of the angel's hand and eat it, and it would be sweet in his mouth, and then it would become bitter in his stomach. Well, the angel that he takes the book out of, which Sister White tells us that's the book of Daniel, the angel that he takes the book from to eat, he comes down out of heaven, in Revelation 10, verse 1, Sister White tells us that's Christ. The book is Daniel. And when John goes and takes that little book and eats it, it becomes sweet in his mouth. And when it became sweet in his mouth, because he's representing the Millerites, is on August 11, 1840. Because on August 11, 1840, the year-day principle of Bible prophecy was confirmed before the world, and the message the Millerites had been proclaiming suddenly was very sweet. The whole world seen that what they were saying was correct. Four years later, it's going to be bitter in his stomach. But in 1840, when the angel comes down, he empowers the message. We're going to deal with this tomorrow more in detail. But by June of 1842, the Protestant churches, Sister White says this, and I'll have notes for you tomorrow on this subject. In June of 1842, the Protestant churches begin to close their door against the Millerite message. How many are familiar with that quote, Testimonies, Volume 1, page 21? Say amen so the others can hear. Okay, so the closing, Sister White says the fall of Babylon, and that's what it was. When they started closing their doors against the Millerites, that's the beginning of the fall of Babylon. But Sister White is very clear that the fall of Babylon is progressive. But it begins in June of 1842. Why? The first angel's message is going through history here. It's puttering along. But then when the year-day principle is confirmed, the, the first angel's message, it becomes powerful. Amen. All right. Miller's meetings go from a meeting like this in 1838 to two or 3,000 people in 1840. Because now they realize the year day principle, it works. And what he's saying about the end of the world, it's scary. But something between 1840 and 1842 happens that makes the Protestants start closing the door. In the next quote, 
It says, in May of 1842, a general conference was convened in Boston, Massachusetts. At the opening of this meeting, Brethren Charles Fitch and Apollos Hill of Haber Hill presented the pictorial prophecies of Daniel John, which they painted on cloth with the prophetic numbers showing their fulfillment. Brother Fitch, in explaining from his chart before the conference, said while examining these prophecies, he had thought if he could get out something of the kind as here presented, it would simplify the subject and make it easier for him to present to an audience. Here was more light on our pathway. pathway. These brethren had been doing the work the Lord had shown Habakkuk in his vision, 246... 2468 years before, saying, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. After some discussion on the subject, it was voted unanimously to have 300 similar to this one lithograph, which was soon accomplished. They were called the charts. This was a very important conference. A camp meeting was now appointed to convene the last week in June in East Kingston, New Hampshire, where an immense multitude assembled to hear the good news and the glad tidings of the coming of our blessed Lord. What I want you to see here from this comment from Joseph Bates, if you will, the same time that they're producing this chart, they decide we're going to start having camp meetings. The same place that they decide to make this chart is where they determine we're going to have camp meetings. At the same time. Same conference. So what's that mean? It means what closes the doors on the Protestant churches is this chart. And the Lord knew it. So he also led the Millerites to begin having camp meetings. Okay, at the same time, if you're going to get technical about this history. Uh, the bottom of the page from Testimonies Volume 1 is the one I quoted to. In June of 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures in Portland. I felt it a great privilege to attend these lectures, for I had fallen under discouragement and did not feel prepared to meet my Savior. This second course created much excitement in the city than the first. With few exceptions, the different denominations closed the doors of their churches against Mr. Miller. When? In June of 1842, the closing of the doors began. In May, in May, this chart is produced. And the same time they're producing this chart, they decide they're going to start having camp meetings. So the Lord foresees that the churches are going to start closing their doors against them. And in His providence, He leads them to begin having camp meetings. At the same time, because the Lord knew what was coming. But, why did, why, why did the doors close? Who was the leader of the Millerites? William Miller. William Miller, right? The next quote is from William Miller. Page 9. William Miller, Apology and Defense, page 25. I have never been positive as to any particular day for the Lord's appearing, believing that no man could know the day or hour. This is William Miller. In all my published lectures, it will be seen on the title page about the year 1843. In all my oral lectures, he's saying some of my lectures, he says, in all my oral lectures, I invariably told my audiences that the per periods would terminate in 1843 if there was no mistake in my calculation, but that I could not say the end might not come even before that time and they should be continually prepared. So what William Miller is here saying is he's saying, I, I was identifying the year 1843 to my audiences, but I wasn't being dogmatic about it. I was letting them know my calculations could be a little bit off. But notice the next statement. In 1842, some of my brethren preached with great positiveness the exact year and censured me for putting in the if and you notice that the kid, if is in capital letters, that's William Miller, that's not me. In 1842, the other Millerite preachers started preaching 1843 with great positiveness, and they started to, to rebuke William Miller for not doing the same thing. Why did they start preaching it with great positiveness? Because the Lord had led them to produce this chart 
and they were all using this chart. And you couldn't have this chart in front of a group of audience and be illustrating this and say, well, you know, all of this is up here, but maybe this isn't right. <laughs> Particularly when they believed that this was a fulfillment of prophecy that the Lord had led them to produce this chart. And they knew if you didn't believe that this chart was a fulfillment of prophecy, that you've left the original faith. They understood the significance of this chart, and William Miller had never wanted to be real dogmatic about it, and they started putting pressure on him saying, Brother Miller, we need to be united on this. We're all using this chart. Get on board. In 1842, some of my brethren preached with great positiveness the exact year and censured me for putting in an if. The public press had also published that I had fixed it up on a definite day, the 23rd of April, for the Lord's advent. Therefore, in December of that year, as I could see no error in my reckoning, I published my belief that sometime between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844, the Lord would come. So, some had their minds fixed on particular days, but I could see no evidence for such unless the types of the Mosaic Law pointed to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now notice, during the year 1843, the most violent denunciations were heaped upon me. June of 1842, they start closing the doors against them, but by the time you get to 1843, the war is underway. And what brings the war underway is the arrival of the 1843 Pioneer Chart into that history, which forces them to take the if out of the calculations and say the Lord is returning in 1843, period. That's interesting history. But it becomes very serious history if you ever understand from prophecy that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. It means that when the, the charts come back into history, in the history of the 144,000, when they arrive back in history, they're going to create a controversy that's going to bring about the closing of the door. That's how I understand. During the year 1843, the most violent denunciations were heaped upon me and the, those associated with me by the press and some pulpits. Our motives were assailed, our principles misrepresented, and our character traduced. Time passed on, and the 21st of March, 1844, went by without our witnessing the appearing of our Lord. Our disappointment was great, and many walked no more with us. Sister so White said it was a test. Previously to this, in the fall of 1843, some of my brethren began to call the churches Babylon. That's the second angel's message. Now notice, if you, you've got to be a careful reader here. William Miller is saying that in the fall of 1843, some of the Millerite preachers begin to say that the churches were Babylon. But Sister White's going to tell us that it's the summer, she says the summer of 1844, the second angel's message was first preached. How do you reconcile William Miller saying it's in the fall of 1843 and Sister White saying it's the summer? the summer of 1844. Well, you've got to go with Sister White if you've got to choose. But the way I understand it is, is what's being described for us through inspiration and history in agreement with, with what she says in the Great Controversy is that the fall of Babylon is progressive. And we're seeing an illustration of Protestantism closing their door on the message, persecution escalating, and the beginning of people saying that those churches that are persecuting us are Babylon until in the summer of 1844, it's a, a unified message, but maybe this isn't relevant if you have a, if you're just learning this history. Previously to this, in the fall of 1843, some of the brethren began to call the church's battle and to urge that it was, it was the duty of Adventists to come out of them. While this, with this I was much grieved, as not only the effect was very bad, but I regarded it as perversion of the word of God, a resting of the scripture. But the practice spread extensively, and from that time the churches, as might have been expected, were closed against us. See, now he's saying that in the fall of 1843 the churches were closed against us, and Sister White says, with few exceptions, in June of 1842, the the churches close their doors. So what you're seeing here is a, what I believe we're seeing here is a historical t testimony of a progressive closing of the doors, a progressive fall of Babylon. It prejudiced many, it prejudiced many against us so that they would not listen to the truth. 
He created a deep feeling of hostility between Adventists and those who did not embrace the doctrine so that most of the Adventists were separated from their respective churches. This was a result which I never desired nor expected, but was brought about by unforeseen circumstances. We could then only act in accordance with the position in which we were thus placed. William Miller. The Great Controversy 376 says this, and, and if you're coming throughout the week, there, there is an important point I'm trying to put in place for further on during the week, and that is, is that the fall of Babylon is progressing. Okay? You can see it in the Millerite history, but you have to understand that here at the end of the world. So that, that's why I'm taking some time here if you're wondering what my purpose is. I can't really put it in place here tonight. I'm not going to try, but I'm alerting you to consider what we're sharing here and see if this makes sense to you that the fall of Babylon is progressive and then we'll try to show you the implications of that later on. As his, I put in there Miller's, as his work tended to build up the churches, it was for a time regarded with favor. But as ministers and religious leaders decided against the advent doctrine and desired to suppress all agitation on the subject, they were not only they not only imposed it from the pulpit, but denied their members the privilege of attending preaching upon the second advent, or even of speaking of their hope in the social meetings of the church. Thus the believers found themselves in a position of great trial and perplexity. They loved their churches and were loath to separate from them, but as they saw the testimony of God's word suppressed and the right to investigate the prophecies denied, they felt that loyalty to God forbid them to submit. Those who sought to shut out the testimony of God's word, they could not regard as constituting the church of Christ the pillar and the ground of truth. Hence, they felt themselves justified and separated from their former connection. In the summer of 1844, about 50,000 withdrew from the churches. <clears throat> Last quote, Great Controversy 389. The second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844. William Miller said in the fall of 1843, some of the brethren began to call the churches Babylon. You're seeing, you're either seeing disagreement or you're seeing a progressive illustration. It was first preached in the summer of 1844 and then it had a more direct application to the churches of the United States. So where was the second angel's message fulfilled? In the United States. Okay. We'll want to see that tomorrow. Where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected, and where the declension in the churches had been most rapid. But the message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. The churches then experienced a moral fall in consequence of the refusal of the light of the Advent message, but that fall was not complete. And as they have continued to reject the special truths for this time, they have fallen lower and lower. Not yet, however, can it be said that Babylon has fallen because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. She has not yet made all nations do this. The spirit of world conforming and indifference to the testing truths for our time exists and has been gaining ground in churches of the Protestant faith, faith in all countries of Christendom. And these churches are included in the solemn and terrible denunciation of the second angel. But the work of apostasy, apostasy has not yet reached its culmination. The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and that they that receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Not until this condition shall be reached, and the union of church and state with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom, will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one, and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. So let me ask you a question. Number one, the point I want to, one of the points I want you to see here, if you will, is the fall of Babylon came about by, re by the rejection of the first angel's message. It's cause and effect. When the message rejected, then, then there's a pr divine pronouncement that Babylon has fallen. But the rejection of the, and the fall of Babylon is progressive. It begins back here, but it doesn't reach its complete fulfillment until the end of the world. Okay? That's one thing I want you to see. But as Seventh-day Adventists, you may not have thought this one through, but this is pioneer understanding, and it is correct. The first angel of Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, arrived in history in 1798. 
Okay, we'll show you some quotes along that line later on this week. That's when the first angel's message arrives. It's in power in 1840 when the year-day principle is confirmed. The second angel's message arrives in June of 1842 because that's when the churches begin to close their doors. But when is it that the second angel's message is in power? As Seventh-day Adventists, we, we generally know this. It's at the midnight cry. The midnight cry empowers the second angel's message. That's correct, standard Adventist understanding. The third angel's message arrived on October 22, 1844. And when is the third angel's message empowered? It's empowered when the angel of Revelation 18 joins with it. So what I want you to see, if you will, is that all three messages, they first arrive in history, and then later on, they're empowered. The first angel's message arrives in 1798, it's empowered in 1840. Second angel's message arrives in June of 1842, it's empowered at the midnight cry, August 11th through 17th, August 12th through 17th, 1844, at the Exeter camp meeting. The midnight cry arrives and empowers the second angel's message. Third angel's message arrives on October 22nd, 1844, and it's empowered when the angel of Revelation 18 joins with it at the end of the world. Okay, we've got that in place. So let me ask you a question. We're at the end of our meetings. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask a test question. Some of you will know this answer, and I would ask for your silence. So everyone else that doesn't know it can think through it. First angel's message arrives in 1798. Second angel's message arrives in 1842. Third angel's message arrives in 1844. The second angel's message arrived in June of 1842. Was that the perfect fulfillment of the second angel's message? Who, who said yes? Yes. Okay. The last thing we just read, look the very last statement, the change is a progressive one, and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8, which is the second angel's message, is yet future. Okay, the, even though the second angel's message was fulfilled in the Millerite history, that isn't the perfect fulfillment. The perfect fulfillment is at the end of the world. Okay? That was a trick question. I'm glad you brought I wasn't trying to embarrass anyone. I wanted to, just to think through this. If this was the imperfect, and I don't mean in a bad way, but just using Sister White's terminology, if the arrival of the second angel's message in this history was the imperfect fulfillment, then the arrival of the third angel's message in 1844 was also an imperfect fulfillment of the third angel's message. And that was easy to see. As Seventh-day Adventists, we know what the third angel's message is. What's the third angel's message? It's a warning against receiving the mark of the beast, right? Was there a Sunday law on October 22, 1844? No. There was no mark of the beast. The arrival of the third angel's message in October of 1844 was an imperfect fulfillment of the third angel's message, or in prophetic language, it was a type of the anti of the perfect fulfillment, the anti-type at the end of the world. Okay, you may wonder why I'm saying some of these things. I'm saying these things to get them in your mind because we're going to deal with them, apply them in a special way later on during the week. Are there any questions? Because we're done this evening, other than if there are some questions. No question? Pardon me? Yeah, that's not possible. Yeah, I knew it was possible. All right. Okay. Let me give me one moment to think that I have, to think about what I've said so I don't forget. Wake up in the middle of the night and I should have said this. But there, I do have an answer for you that we, we've been printing this for a while and some of the brethren that are doing it, they recently went in on Photoshop or whatever, I don't know, not a computer guy, and they cleaned them up. The, the one, on the, if you get that on the computer, yeah. and you zoom in, you can read it. Okay, yeah, and if you, if you take the, the file and put it on your computer, 
then you can make it crystal clear. You can take a section out of it and look at it. But what I'm saying is we're printing ones now that are the same as this, but they are a little clearer. And they look better, on, they look, they're more readable on white paper, but if you're going to go out teaching it, vinyl is the way to go. Yeah, I use paper ones for a long time and they have to replace it.